All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish, Entering the Kingdom of the Cults. My name is Jeremiah Roberts, one of the co-hosts here. I'm here, as always, with Andrew, the super sleuth of the show. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well, and it feels good to be back in the studio. I feel like we were on the road for a little bit. You know what I, I mean? I know. I know. Cultish in bed, doing a little doing a little on the, on the little road tour and all that sort of stuff. And yeah. so it's always good to be back here in the studio. And we are here with Teresa Gentry. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah, good, good. So, I just want to start off by saying we were, we were talking a bit last night, and you know we we've spoke a couple times in prep for you coming on here. You drove out here from California. Yep. And when I first connected with you, I uh, it was uh, Jeff, Pastor Jeff had brought uh, just your story to my attention. And because he had just met you when they were working on the church plant in Kauai. Mm-hmm. And I remember right away, I just went to your Facebook photos and I noticed there's this stark contrast. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a saying that if a picture is worth a thousand words, your Facebook profile at that time was, I would just say, and we'll, we'll delve into it and you'll understand as we unpack your story. There was uh, just an amount of just amount of involvement in the new age. I mean, if you ever want to just look at a resume and pictures <laughs> and of someone who is a true believer living it out to the fullest, it was that. All of a sudden, there's a shift where you talk about being born again and everything's about Jesus and everything else. And so that's uh, it's quite the story. So it's an honor to be able to finally have you in the studio to really unpack your story. I think a lot of people are going to be blessed by this. So. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so do you want to just maybe talk about, give it like three to four minutes about just your involvement and just so people can get an understanding because some on, our, on YouTube, we might share a couple of pictures and images and things like that to kind of give people a visual of your involvement. But can you just give people just a brief overview of some of the things you were involved in before we kind of jump into your story? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I was really deep for over 13 years and... Um, I considered myself to all be all sorts of things in that world, everything from a ceremonial artist to a medicine woman. I was an initiated priestess on a Dakini and was a keeper of the Red Tent Mysteries and um, an intuitive clairvoyant. I also channeled. I channeled all sorts of things, both just in consciousness and also through my dance. The ecstatic dancing was everything to me. That was my my most spiritual practice in that world. Um, And uh, yeah, I had a large bag of tricks of uh, things within the altered consciousness realms, not just psychedelics and stuff like that, but breath works and all kinds of different practices that would alter your consciousness. Um, I was an earth worshiper, an ama devotee, a yoga teacher. Uh, I actually just, you know, like jokingly looking at the time, considered myself to be a spiritual junkie. And mm-hmm. I actually had like some pride in that term. Hmm. Like I thought it was cute. And uh, yeah, now, of course, I know what I was, you know, deeply seeking, uh, but couldn't find in that world. I really feel like I searched almost every corner, not not all of them. There was a few I didn't get, make it to, but most of them. Uh, and, um, yeah, I even got my degree <laughs> in new age at a school that is casually called hippie Harvard, mm-hmm. very well accredited and tons of different masters and right. really professional people that I studied under at that mm-hmm. school. So, yeah. So you're talking about just a brief overview this is yeah. just an example. We'll, we'll kind of unpack some of these practices. Totally. Some people may be familiar with that. We're just trying to say that you are. I, there's a quote that, and I can't remember the exact source, but it says almost anything worth doing is worth overdoing, <laughs> and that that would probably be accurate, part and parcel to the mindset if you had it, just just going after 110. Mm-hmm. percent um, Also, just real quickly, we'll we'll unpack this as well, but geographically, there are I think there are certain areas that even of the world, in the same way that Islam would see, you know, would look to Mecca, there are areas geographically uh, that the New Age is very attracted to, likes mm-hmm. to go, likes to frequent uh, in regards to just their worldview and what, what they believe is sort of coming as far as the Aquarian Age and uh, mm-hmm. all those things. But just give an example of some of the places you visited as well, too, mm-hmm. and, and how, how that related to some of the practices. Sure. Uh, well, Burning Man, that's a location. I mean, it's not that far away from where I was living in the Bay Area, but that it's, mm-hmm. it's a place in itself. Um, Bali 
I went to Bali, lived there for three months, um, really experienced it from like the locals perspective. Uh, Guatemala, a little town called San Marcos. It's a hub on Lake Atitlan that's very, very rich with all this. The various islands in Hawaii, mostly Maui and uh, Kauai and Big Island, some also. Um, let's see, Nevada City, my little town that mm -hmm. I lived in before I moved to Kauai. I lived there for four years and it's quite a hub. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say those are the main ones. I visited a lot. I lived in Portland. I kind of, I moved around a lot. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the Johnny Cash song? I've been everywhere kind of, <laughs> but in regards to just new mm -hmm. age and practicing all over the place. So, yeah. Yeah. So maybe jump in. Let's just kind of go back to the very beginning where kind of give people just a kind of a very brief overview. Okay. But if we just jump right in. So let's just start at your childhood. I think you had some interesting upbringing in regards to just your fam family of origin. Mm -hmm. uh, also that affected also spiritual encounters. I don't want to give any way. Just, just bring it, take, give us, take us to the very beginning. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So I grew up in a pretty small town, Mojave, Mojave desert in California. And, um, I did not grow up with any true Christian realm. I, I was told by my grandparents that we were Protestant, but all I really knew that to, knew that to mean was not Catholic. Right. Um, I never saw a Bible. We never went to church. Um, there was no prayer, you know, it wasn't anything tangible. Um, and in fact, I was told that Jesus was a uh, nice story for people to make them feel better about death and such. So it was actually kind of from the beginning, like a made up thing is what mm. I was told. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And I gravitated towards, I guess you would call them occult things as a child, things like Ouija, or uh, am I saying that right? Ouija board. Yeah. Um, and uh, we would do games at slumber parties, like the light as a feather, stiff as a board oh, and wow. stuff. And I would have really powerful experiences with that. Um, Bloody Mary in the mirror. I was just mirror. thinking Bloody Mary in my head. Yeah. Wow. I had a, yeah, I mean, some, a lot of stuff happened when yeah. I did these things. Like I, Yeah, absolutely. And... I started seeing like from a very young age and like other realms, like stuff, I could see things in the sky. We grew up next to a large military base and um, I could see ships and various things in the sky and my brother mm. could see them, but my parents couldn't. Mm. Strange stuff, you know, like I, right. who knows? I don't have an answer to that necessarily, but. Um, How old? Oh gosh, from like elementary school onward. Um, lots of different stories, probably save that for another time, but, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh yeah. And then also overlapping with, with some of these same things was um, sleep paralysis. I, I had an ongoing sleep paralysis situation that whew, it was, for lack of a better way to describe it, sort of like an altered consciousness state later down the road that I would experience where it was the same kind of realm that I would be brought back to time and time and time again that would cause panic. It would cause it wasn't as scary as what you hear from some people's sleep paralysis where there's like, you know, monsters or the big dark guy or something. It was like a realm that I had to navigate and figure out. And I would wake up like just eventually I would be mm -hmm. able to come out of it. And my mom would have to calm me down for like hours. It would be really intense. And it wow. happened often, like several times a year, like for years on end. Um, let's see what else. I, uh, yeah, I was... <sighs> I I mean, I grew up with some, some hardships, some family hardships and such, and uh, I started contemplating suicide at a very young age, like mm -hmm. five years old and um, maybe six, but, you know, really young. Just, I mean, I never tried it or anything at that age, but I was, I was fantasizing about it, ideation. Interesting. Yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, it led to you know, in my essentially like, you know, preteen, teen years, just a total mess. I was, I had a lot of wounds, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering that was just not dealt with. And um, everybody's wounds kind of bumping into each other and my yeah. family. So yeah, by the time I was, um, gosh, I mean, I think the first time I got drunk was like, 12 or 13 years old I was quite young and then by like 15 I was pretty much a full-blown alcoholic like mm. really just seeking some sort of it was insatiable this desire of 
I mean, all sorts of things. I became, you know, the class clown. I was like voted class clown and it was like a st- attention, you know, mm-hmm. I wanted attention. I wanted some sort of satisfaction that nobody gave me any, you know, understanding of what that could be. Yeah. So it's almost like, would you say you were just looking for different ways to try and sometimes either cope with the different traumas or in some ways suppress them? I mean, mm-hmm. that's just one of the aspects, and I don't remember the exact reference of where this is from, but, mm-hmm. you know, some people say that they'll, you know, they'll drink, you know, heavily to, to drown their sorrows, oh, but yeah. sorrows are incredibly good swimmers. Mm. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they're they very, yes, they just know how to just, you know, go to the top and everything yeah. like that. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that's just, uh, just one of those huge things when it comes to, to dealing with all that. But this affected you where you mentioned that you because of that you just became very just a lot you had just a lot of anger a lot of resentment toward towards authority and that mm-hmm. that would act out in many different ways mm-hmm. so again you it's part and parcel to both the spiritual encounters that you were having but also a lot of the trauma and dysfunction so maybe going into your teen years you can talk about that was there anything else too in regards to your childhood do you think that's just a good brief overview anything else you want to talk about um well you know the some of the like strange stuff that i experienced as a child but i don't have answers to it so Mm -hmm. um well yeah well i think it is one of those things too that you know we had our episode two of the episode of kristen bellamy you can give your thoughts too andrew is that you know she talked about from a very young age she Mm -hmm. would have a dark figure following uh, them around and, and in fact we're dealing with when we're, when we're looking at cultish when we're t- kind of unraveling these things you know some of the, for some people they'll i always call them the skepticals right when you start hearing about these claims about ufo's or seeing alien ships or being followed by a dark figure but in reality that if we have a biblical framework in which to work with like right now we can only see tangibly right with our eyes we see you you know, we're here, we see the kombucha, mm-hmm. you know, that's here in the studio. We've got our, our iPads and computers laid out, but we can't see, we can't see the unseen realm with our naked eye. Mm-hmm. What, what we do have is we have a framework to make sense of these, what the unseen realm is mm-hmm. or the have or the heavenly places as scripture would call it. So that's one of the things we want to emphasize that as we unpack your story, mm-hmm. that we look at this through a biblical framework, not sensationalizing it, but just telling the truth and, and, to, and to have that foundation the same way. If you've listened to our episode on Kristen Bell, I mean, did you have a thought on that, Andrew? Yeah. And I think the enemy uh, likes to capitalize on, on people who don't have a proper understanding, a biblical framework of what's going on around them. Like mm. for me personally, as a, Growing up a child as well, I, ex- I had experienced things. I did have a biblical framework within uh, the frame I was experiencing, which, which made me a little bit more terrified in <laughs> terms of the unseen realm because I thought and knew it was demonic, what was going mm. on around me, which terrified me. But at the same time, I knew that, what the answer was, right? Mm. But I could see growing up with like a, like a dark cloud or an aura around you and being within a family framework that doesn't have the biblical understanding to make sense of it. The enemy wants to capitalize on it. And wants you to run to anything but Jesus right. to try to fill in the the void in your life to um, make this trauma essentially go away. Mm-hmm. But but really, I mean, like even even when I was a teenager, I know I personally uh, was was partying at the age of 14, 15, like the same thing. I was drinking all the time mm-hmm. and I was trying to overcome trauma without going to Christ, even though I knew who the answer was. But all I did was end up magnifying my trauma mm. for the mm. longest time in my mm-hmm. life where you talked about your your family throwing wounds at one another it, mm-hmm. it, we end up doing that to everyone around ourselves right at that age we just really want to project our wounds on other people to give them this type of empathy so we all just empathize with one another and our wounds we make each other feel yeah in a sense that's kind of like how i'm hearing it uh portrayed right now with what's going yeah. on yeah yeah i mean it wasn't conscious I for right. me anyways like of it was course. all um reactionary I didn't mm-hmm. even know it was reactionary it was just it was who I was it yeah. was it was what I saw it was I mean you know some of my friends the same you know I, I think possibly worse in my case for certain things you know I mean I was like bringing coffee to school to school with like peppermint schnapps in it like it was all day every day you know that was my that was my focus like that was Mm -hmm. what I wanted to yeah escape essentially but 
I don't know, I guess it's different where I see people now and they like know they're escaping by having that glass of wine. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. It was just what we did, what mm-hmm. I was doing. And I mean, all kinds of stuff, you know, driving our cars insane across the desert till they broke down. And I mean, there's numerous stories all over the place of I should have died. I don't even know how many times. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it, it was... Um, kind of one reaction after another building like you said on top of itself just a mess and Hmm. yeah and pain too there was a lot of you know like my brother and i had problems and there was there was stuff that um yeah i i had no identity in christ i had no identity in anything but Mm -hmm. the wounds being thrown around yeah so i mean you would just so another in summary you just at that point you know especially in your childhood going up into your teens i mean you're just Mm -hmm. sort of desperately clamming for anything that can give any sort of peace Mm -hmm. sense of meaning and purpose but also sort of cope with and deal with and sometimes try and stuff down and suppress you know all the different struggles of of your upbringing there so yeah i pretty much have they're from your teen years and like I said, it had being, you know, having sort of that rebel attitude and anger and hating authority and dealing with all that. And then eventually that affected you as you kind of grew up in adolescence in your twenties. And so do you want to, do you want to go ahead and talk about that a little bit? Cause sure. you, you mentioned that and it led to art school and it got yeah. kind of interesting from there. <laughs> Some weird stuff. Yeah. The life before the life in the new age. Yeah. yeah. Um, multiple lives yeah. <laughs> before finding Christ. Uh, yeah. So my teenage years, angry, alcoholic, full, full blown alcoholic, you know, and that, that proceeded. I, I went off to college, just, I went where all my friends went. Like it wasn't, I didn't know what I wanted to study. I didn't have any direction. Um, and yeah, I started getting into sort of the typical, you know, smoking a lot of pot and, yeah. you know, s- experimenting with mushrooms and, somewhat typical, you know, going to the frat parties and just kind of a normal college life. But then uh, I jumped around colleges a few times um, and ended up in art school in San Francisco. And that's where things got really interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I was studying photography and film and um, living in a house full of other artists. And we... Yeah, we were right downtown in San Francisco and, you know, just involved in like the the night scene there and everything. And one night, this is before Brittany did it, but I ended up shaving my head um, in sort of a similar way. Like when I saw her do it a few years later, I was like, wow, that was weird. Um, Mm -hmm. And yeah, but then my friend, she was watching and she said, oh, let's give her a mohawk instead. And um, so I ended up with a pink mohawk and then just in I was going to all the thrift stores in San Francisco so I would dress in pink head to toe and became not super well known at all but in some of those smaller scenes in the bars and kind of you know the I don't know how to call it like uh I haven't been to bars in years but you know like the the bar scene yeah like you were the not the posh bars like the bars that are kind of you know like um, rockish almost a little bit like people always think that I was some punk rock but I just like the look it wasn't right. like I actually was listening to all the music and everything mm-hmm. like I kind of had an anarchist vibe but that makes you yeah. sound way more punk rock by the way <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay right yeah <laughs> I get it yeah but it seems like you'd be, that'd be like around the early 2000s so that's somewhat yeah. indicative of the culture of that I'm just trying to think of the different music that was around at that time so uh, it would just and just some of the, the music culture so it seems like something like that in San Francisco would just sort of be indicative or just kind of stand out ish or just congruent with where things were at that time yeah i mean there was there was definitely an interesting trend Mm -hmm. rising amongst some of the underground kind of you know subculture scenes and i was reasonably well known started you know i was into you know putting things up my nose and some not so classy you know drugs and stuff like that but um well actually people think those kind of drugs are classy when they're doing them but um yeah and anyways um you know, I ended up, we went to an art school party and I took my friend, my roommate had a snake, a pet snake, a boa constrictor, and I had it wrapped around my neck and we went to the party that way. And I met what ended up being my long-term partner in my twenties. And, um, yeah, we were both kind of a hot mess to be totally honest. We were both drinking a lot and whatever, Mm. but, um, he was, I would say one of the first major folks that like really started opening up the idea he, he he posed things to me like oh there's two choices in life fear versus love mm. 
And like, you can actually like kind of break that down in the Bible, but like, of course it wasn't from a biblical perspective. His mom was actually quite deep in like some new age type stuff. And his dad was a ex Mason, um, high Mm -hmm. level Mason. And, um, so they, they were really, um, for lack of a better word, woke. I don't really like that word. You know, it's used in all different ways. But It's very much a pejorative for sure. Yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they were, they they told me all sorts of stuff that I wasn't aware of about the world. And who knows? I mean, not, not necessarily all of it is 100% truth, but they got me to question things. The narrative that we were all force fed through school or, you know, the media or whatever mm-hmm. it was. And um, so that... That started shifting things quite a bit. I was a professional makeup artist in San Francisco and um, working a lot. And I actually started like by the time, um, yeah, I would say mid 2000s, uh, I started getting quite not well. Like I was having some major health problems. Right. And I mean, looking back on it, of course, by that point I was. 12 years deep as an alcoholic and suppressing all this anger and, you know, just a mess. Um, And uh, proceeded to, yeah, get quite sick and like Western medicine was stumped. Mm. They mostly didn't really know what to do for me to help. Mm -hmm. So they ended up sticking me on steroids, which was atrocious. I personally... Like that kind of, I'm very sensitive and it, it was, it was very uncomfortable. It was almost worse than what the sickness was. Right. So my partner at the time, he, even though <laughs> he was, you know, a graffiti artist and a skateboarder and all kinds of kind of, you know, rebellious stuff himself, he had this inner healer, if you will, inside and was exposed to a lot as a child. So he started taking me to a naturopathic doctor and I was resistant to going. I <laughs> sensed something about them potentially having like witchiness, which is so strange because I don't know where that came from. But right. but I went and the doctor um, had a field day trying to figure out what was going on with me and hair analysis and right. all the things. And so she comes back, well, we're going to have to start alkalizing your body. I didn't know what that meant. I'm like, like a pool. And... Um, yeah, so the the journey began to fixing my health, and I went from drinking like a bottle a half of wine every night and smoking a ton of pot and all this to being sober. And I quit my job as a makeup artist, started um, doing a raw alkaline diet, full like raw alkaline, you know, no fruit, no nothing that broke down into sugar, and was running every day and just totally shifting everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is just something real quick, just to just to comment, and Andrew, you can jump on it too. Is that this is just one of the many gateways into the new age when it comes to just like a lot of the different naturopathy and natural medicine. I mean, if you go to a Whole Foods or even Sprouts, where everyone wants to know too, this is kombucha. This is not. Uh, yeah. This is not. We're not. Yeah. So if any of the YouTube <laughs> comments are going crazy right now of us uh, of alcoholic beverage here on set, and this is non-alcoholic kombucha right here. <laughs> but in many ways, like if you look at if you go into a whole place like a Whole Foods or a Natural Grocers or whatever is over there in California, there'll just be a lot of books, a lot of the a lot of the ideas behind it. It'll be subtly infused within uh, a lot of different New Age concepts and ideas. Mm-hmm. In the same way, how New Age will use things like quantum physics or some of those things that are mm-hmm. very vague and nuanced, and they try and slip in universal consciousness. You know, between that, they'll look at something like a product that would help with your digestion Mm -hmm. for example that will be real and effective and there are health benefits that go to that but but then it goes down a path to this is how you know you clear out all your chakras and then it it leads to that and that's and that's really what happened with you oh totally i mean i i was i was sort of open to that stuff but not really Uh and um yeah, no, I had no idea. I was completely unsuspecting. And it was before it was massively trendy like it is now, too. But it was still in there. And uh, yeah, so it was actually one of my my um, therapists. I had all kinds of different health therapists for different things. And this one that I went to, um, she really, she <laughs> she she planted a lot of seeds um, that eventually very much so sprouted. But uh she gave me a copy of the movie The Secret. Mm. 
right after it first came out. Like, not The Secret, the film that came out recently. It was more like a documentary back in the day. I remember that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, she told me, because I was doing the rebounding machine, you know, it's like a trampoline for your lymph system, basically. Yeah. It's great, but... Wasn't there a documentary, too, that was similar called, like, What the Bleep yeah. Do Now? Oh. I think that was a little bit after or before. I watched... Okay. I definitely was aware of that, like, from when it came out also. Okay. That's in my, my longer testimony. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> um, whenever that was, I can't remember. But... Uh, yeah, similar type concept. Yeah, so um, Abraham Hicks. I was I was reading a book, and it was yeah, it was totally new to me, but uh, a definite. It switched everything. I, I I mean, it was like I was. I remember making the analogy. It was as if I was studying for the bar exam. I mean, I had that thing highlighted and sticky notes, and you know, writing in the margins. It was. I mean, how I study yeah. the Bible now, but hmm. it was like that, like, just what is this thing, huh? You know? And, uh, yeah. So it was kind of becoming, you know, this idea of, Ooh, wait, maybe there's another life that's going to happen. You know, it was opening, but I wasn't quite there yet. And then, so one day I'm running home from Golden Gate Park. I was running through the park every day, up to five miles a day. And um, I decided to take 9th Avenue instead of 5th Avenue. And I see a sign, green alkaline juice. And there was no raw food restaurants and stuff back then. It was a totally, so I go in, it's a cafe and I'm like, wow, I can eat out again. Cause mm -hmm. as a raw foodie, you're right. spending all this time at home doing the thing. And so we started going there regularly and uh kind of became friends with the people and whatnot but i was resistant to all things hippie i was not hippie and i felt that there and i was like mm. so anyways um we moved to the mission in san francisco and there was the original one of these cafes there started going and then i actually was breaking up with my partner because he was still kind of involved in a lot of the drinking and other stuff and i'm moving into this like health conscious person mm. So I got my own place and started working at the cafe, mostly because I wanted a discount on their food. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually a school of transformation disguised as a raw food restaurant, hmm. right? And I mean, they wrote a whole book on the concept of um, like how to include spirituality in your commerce and they had practices that, that they would do. Yeah, and it was called, it was called Landmark Education, right? No. The cafe, you mention it, <laughs> uh, the cafe is called Cafe Gratitude. Yes, yes. Yeah, but it is connected to Landmark Education, and I did end up doing that about three months after I started working okay. there. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh huh. But they're they're two separate things. Right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We were up late trying to, yeah. to practice and pack everything together. Was it, so we're just so much stuff. it was like a family owned business with yeah. the mom, the dad, the, the child worked there too or something. Yeah, or? pretty much in the yeah. beginning. It's grown quite a bit and it actually is now all over Southern California in like more of a kind of chain or franchise or one of those kind of words. Um but I was, I mean, I was working at the number one location and the owners at that point were literally like in the back making the desserts, which at some point, you know, there was a whole central kitchen and all kinds of stuff that when it grew, because at one point there was about, I don't know, 10 or more of these all over the Bay Area. So the amount of production for raw food is no joke. Um, so anyways, it's a culture. This place is a total like hub of, well, now looking back, new age type stuff, but very genuine, loving yeah. People. In fact, I just pulled up right now the, on the phone. Cafe uh -huh. Gratitude. Yeah. It yeah. It's very congruent with what you're talking about. It's, you know what? I went to one somewhat recently, like uh -huh. a few years ago um, before I was saved uh, down in Southern California. And it's nowhere near what it was when I worked there. Like mm. as far as a lot of it, it's got, it's streamlined, you know, with, yeah. any, with any business, once it gets. Once it goes corporate, it, it loses that personal touch. The owners are amazing. Like I, I do, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for them. They're doing a lot of good, like good Samaritan type work in the world. They're, they're good people. You know, I'm not trying to. So, um, yeah. And honestly, what my, my time there. So I, I was there for three months. They kept trying to, they, they, they pay. So landmark education is, it's a type of school that's, um, about bettering yourself essentially. And, um, the restaurant came from landmark from from the owners 
experience through Landmark Education is how they decided to make the restaurant. So therefore, in turn, they decide to give their employees a free experience through Landmark. Oh, wow. Right. So they encourage you. They don't make you, but they encouraged you. I don't know if they still do, but they did at the time to do it. And I was resistant to doing it. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I did. I ended up going with my best friend at the time in that whole world. And um, I, the first few days was like, my goodness, you guys need to go on Dr. Phil or Oprah or something. It was so dramatic, all these people with their wounds and everything. And I didn't acknowledge, you know, it wasn't there yet, my awareness (laughs) of that. And then on day three. I had this just like breakthrough. They call it popcorn. It was a late, a late kernel, you know, like mm. a late piece of, you know, the last piece of popcorn that goes poo at the mm-hmm. end. Well, I was that person. And um, I had, I remember explaining it like it was like my consciousness hit a brick wall of like, okay, boom, new, newness. You know, it was just total everything that I thought shifted, you know, I jokingly called it like a red pill moment, you know, and, um, And yeah, I realized, oh my goodness, I've lived my whole life as a victim, as a wounded child from these experiences. Like I finally saw it and um, whoa, I can create something new. I got a taste. I mean, we were talking last night and I was like, it was like you know, my first hit of heroin, you know, I mean, yeah. I, mean I never did that. I never did that drug, but um, in, you know, in concept and uh, <sighs> Yeah, and then it was on. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's where I went from zero to 180, you know, I mean, just like full throttle. And yeah, so I we created a home called the Goddess Vortex with a bunch of other women doing the same kind of work that all worked at the restaurant. And we were very conscious and loving and doing yeah. all the practices together and sharing. Right. And and this was a very, and this was even as a small mom pop shop, it was it was very popular in that area. And it was, oh yeah, it was, right. Talk about some of the, it even got some uh, celebrities that got interested yeah. in it. Talk just a little bit about that. Yeah, it was, um, <laughs> It was it was it was definitely like uh, ahead of the curve in that whole world. And um, so we had, you know, everyone from like Woody Harrelson and they're on a regular basis, Alanis Morissette, Michael Franti, um, lots of various, you know, teachers and spiritual realms and food gurus, you know, the mm-hmm. Gabriel Cousins and the David Wolfs and, yeah. you know, all those kind of people um, were my regulars at my tables. Mm. And like, yeah, New York, the New York Times came and did uh peace on us and their food and food and wine food and whatever it's called in that in that magazine or i mean newspaper uh about like what is going on in san francisco what is this restaurant you know and they yeah wow you were part of that i was on the cover of that article wow yeah on that new york times the food and wine section not not the whole entire or newspaper but But on the article section yeah right so how, how long was that that school, the landmark school, was it three days or? So, okay, the the landmark education f- like platform, you could do it for the rest of your life okay. and, and never complete all of it. But That's that course kind you of, did? The course I did was a three-day course. It's called the Forum. Okay. And then I actually ended up going forward and doing their curriculum for living, which is like their three foundational level classes back to back and... I would say it took me mm. a year total to do the whole thing because mm-hmm. one of them's like months long and you're, and that's where you build a project, right? So when the owners had gone through Landmark themselves in that one where they build okay. the project, that's when mm-hmm. first the board game, there was a yeah. board game that was part of the restaurant, but it all came from that. Yeah. And I find wow. it interesting too, that when you look at the entirety of the new age and, you know, from our times where we've had, you know, Stephen Bancar's on or talking with other former new mm-hmm. agers is that. I don't, it seems to me there's never a point where you fully arrive. It's always yeah. escalating or they would probably call it you're continually ascending, mm. right? And so it just, it's no end in sight. And so I, I just found it just peculiar that you go there and you're initially, it starts off with a course of just find, finding a way to try and help with some of your trauma and coping me- mechanisms and all that to all of a sudden now it's a temple goddess. Now you're doing this, the, Oh, like, yeah. You're doing all that. And even you mentioned, too, that one of the things they would do prior to going on a shift, mm. they would have it. They called a clearing session, right? Yeah. Talk uh, about that. Just okay. so people can just so people yeah. can understand the atmosphere mm-hmm. of what you're going on. Because right now, this restaurant, the Cafe Gratitude, this is really the, the portal or the catalyst that just threw you into all of this that was your life for 13 years. It, I used to say I was born through that restaurant. And it's funny because I didn't even understand the term born again, but it was essentially like my born again, new age experience right. looking back on it. Yeah. It all started from there. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, so the clearing, they had 12, I believe it was somewhere around there in their book of various, their book's called Sacred Commerce and the idea of creating a business that is, you know, a, a spiritual practice instead of just what the world does. So one of the things that they did is you'd be you'd be clocked in, you'd be getting paid and um, you would sit down with your either boss or manager, whoever was like, you know, the lead shift person that day and... Um, They'd ask you, is there anything in the way of you being present to serve today? And you could be very honest and say, you know, anything from, you know, I've had a fight with my boyfriend. I got a flat tire. You made me upset when I didn't get my shift or my, you know, uh, break yesterday at the right time. You know, whatever, whatever it was. And when it was first starting, we, they would really go deep. It would be like a 20 minute process. And they'd say, you know, like, where do you feel that in your body? Is there some association from another wound that you can like associate with that? You know, it was like mini, like somatic therapy session right. essentially. And, um, and you know, sometimes there'd be tears or frustration or whatever. And, and then it would get to the point where they'd say, so are you ready to put that away? Are you ready to, um, you know, like f- focus on serving? and put that you know aside or away or be done with it Mm. and if you weren't you could literally get your shift covered and go home like they they would support that it would be okay um or you know yes i'm ready to go onto the floor and later you know i mean we were jam-packed and like we had to get rid of a lot of employees when the economy crashed in 2008 yeah because it's around the it's it's a time wise where this is probably like 06 06 to 08 i went there from 07 Seven, eight, nine, I believe is when I was there, somewhere around there. I was there for three years. And I know it was, I started in 07. Um, But yeah, so like a year into it, the economy tanked Mm -hmm. and we had to get rid of a lot of our employees. Simultaneously, all of San Francisco was showing up at our doorstep. We literally had like lines around the block. Like Mm. it was, we were, we were a thing. (laughs) And um, so uh, yeah, if, if it got crazy you could request a clearing throughout the day like if you needed another one and there was things like you know some of the other ones are simple but a minute out loud and someone would would shout it across the the and everybody would um start cracking up and laughing you know like the yoga laughter thing yeah. right right like that kind of thing Trying where those chemicals in your brain going it was actually it was interesting because in the beginning thing you know somebody all like people don't necessarily know what they're in for when they come there to eat food. They're like, Mm. I want to eat, you know, and we're asking them the question of the day. And when you serve them the platter of food, you know, they order the nachos, but instead of saying nachos, they say, I'm ordering the honoring. And then when I bring them the honoring, you are honoring. Right. So it's an affirmative. There's like worship going on in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's really what, I mean, the whole thing is about like, you know, your divine self and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And like even, even the clearing, it's, a, it's an act of confession and repentance. <laughs> you know I never I mean? thought about that, but it's true. That, that's literally mm-hmm. what I was hearing in my head, uh-huh. just like a, a counterfeit version, huh. right? Every religion has to deal with right. it in some sense, but this yeah. way you're looking at the guru, you're confessing to the guru, you're repenting huh. if you can't go home. Yeah. In Interesting. A sense, and figure out what's going on, repent and come back. Yeah. Huh. Interesting you, stuff. Do you, you know what that reminds me of? Is you remember mm. one of our first premiere episodes we did with, with Alexander about when he was, we had a guy on who was a Hare Krishna. He grew up in, the, mm. in a Hare Krishna and he was just a devo- hardcore devotee for about 10 years and mm-hmm. they would get up really early in the morning mm-hmm. and they would you know cook up all this food but before they could even cook for themselves they had to cook to Krishna or whatever right. the Hindu gods were. So it's always interesting to see aspects of the new age where they involve, you know, not just the health, but even like the cooking and yeah. those aspects. It's, just, it's all intermixed together, like this aspect of worship. So, yeah, even the the business type empire, like la- empire, like landmark, like we can think of it like Nexium with Keith Raniere. It's the yeah. same thing. The intro to, to Nexium is essentially someone going in and they're talking. It could take days, but they may have that popcorn moment where all of a sudden they break down in front of everybody, yeah. cry. They have this massive experience and then all of a sudden they're sucked. There's there's more courses now to take. Yeah. You know? Oh, landmark. I mean, it, it. I, I've come across some Christians that are involved in landmark. Well, I believe and, it. And it's you know, I mean, to me, it's night is so clear that that is. I mean, you know, some of this stuff. There's valuable insight to potentially parts of your psyche or something that you're not able to see. Like you know, there was there was things here and there, but jokingly. Because there, there was a lot of different, we were controversial, this restaurant, you know, like people, 
we're trying to, and people called us a cult. Right. And, you know, it's funny here, being here on Cultish now, right? Yeah. Uh, and um, the owner of the restaurant, and like I said, lovely people. Like, I, I'm yeah. not trying to bash anybody, like, involved in the restaurant. They are good people doing the best they can with what they had. And good things for other people, too, you know. Um, just missing the Lord. Um, and, uh, yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> The owner of the restaurant, he came up with like, cult is short for culture and we definitely have a culture, you know, like it was like we played off it. Right, you know, it right. was it was like made it like light of it or whatever. And there was there was a lot of, you know, I mean, eventually there was a lawsuit involving the restaurant and all kinds of stuff. And it, it like we, we we went through some heat as a community for sure. But we like we did. We stood together. You know, I mean, it wasn't. I mean, next year I'm a little more sketch, but you know. <laughs> yeah, but, right. but what's just also yeah. interesting too is that I mentioned you last night. You're familiar with that cult I told you about, the Source family. Yeah. With Father Yod, and this yeah. is back in the 1970s, and they had a similar aspect. Where they were uh-huh. on, they were on Hollywood Boulevard doing raw food. Right. That was that was visited by celebrities like George Harrison, hmm. but with this love for raw food and, and vegan food came the spiritual aspect of mm-hmm. it, including introducing the gospel of the Essenes, in which right. you had familiarity with yeah that was actually back the woman the therapist before i I found the restaurant i was actually introduced i forgot about that the Mm. the the scene gospel of peace and um yeah so that actually did implant some ideas on you know who i might have thought christ was and everything yeah so so here you are you you, you're now into alkaline diets and raw food to kind of help do your health issues you get into the new age and and you're you're there you're in, you're taking these different courses uh you're, you're doing goddess temples and you're getting clearing sessions prior to serving raw yeah. food to different even celebrities and so now it's just this train this train has left the station you're going oh, yeah. forward is are there any other aspects of any other thing from the restaurant you want to kind of elaborate on before we kind of jump on to like where it went from there because it, it just like I said, it just continues to get more interesting. And as we develop this, it's just, it's just good for audience <laughs> yeah. to know that this is typically what happens with someone in the new age is that it's always one practice one usually leads to another, yeah. to another, to another, just because if I can be frank, not, not trying to take a jab at someone who's into it. Like I said, usually people would have a very, anyone else who's into the new age probably has a very similar past yeah. of difficult upbringing, different wounds in their that we're made in the image of God. We have this Jesus shaped hole yep. and they're looking to try and, you know, Walter Martin said, let help us have compassion for these people who are reaching out, you know, for help. Yeah. So that's just something that's really good. That's good to know. But anything else as far as the restaurant is concerned? I mean, compared to like everything else that's coming <laughs> yeah. in this story, I actually, I mean like eye gazing, I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's like where you sit there and you stare into a person's eyes, like, not in terms of it's not supposed to be like you know like i mean it is intimate but not like you know that kind of stuff um but like you just stare to where like the person disappears and you can it's really like looking for their soul or something yeah it gets weird like you know you they they disappear and you become them and all this stuff starts happening it gets Mm. very like multi-dimensional and weird and yeah you Uh, cry all kinds of stuff starts happening there your mirror is essentially what they teach you know i mean i had staring contests with my brothers and sisters (laughs) growing up but that's about it yeah that's like definitely (laughs) not quite the same thing like this is like you know you're trying not to have any words or any Mm. expression or any anything and it I mean, especially for someone like me that had seen things my whole life, it was, right, it, right. you know, major. See, so, but, but what I was going to say just real quick is like that whole world within Cafe Gratitude, like that first, I mean, it started like there was a branch of other stuff that started coming in, but there, it was very contrasty. Some of the stuff that I ended up in and the festival scene and all this other stuff, because the gratitude world was very loving. It was very sweet. It was very um, pure in essence, in terms of the new age, there's can be really weird stuff in the new age as far as dark and heavy and, you know, manipulative and all this stuff. And like the, the that world was actually like, it, it created this like true, genuine, like precious love that I had never felt mm-hmm. in my previous, like, I mean, of course my parents were amazing. And I mean, you know, like close to my family and all that, but, um, this was different. I had never experienced love from the world that felt safe, that felt held, that felt seen, that felt, you know, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. that's just something that was like, it was special to kind of, in a way, to be yeah. born through that in the new the new age as like my, my primary, mm-hmm. because then honestly, it, like everything else contrasted, like there was so much contrast that came mm-hmm. from that point. Yeah, that, That's the hook, right? That's what mm-hmm. hooks you initially in yeah. that spiritual 
uh, sense. But I, I have a question in terms of when this like popcorn moment happens when you're going, uh, when you're working at this location. How did it make you see the things of your your past at that time, like like the like the night terrors essentially that you had, oh. or the sleep paralysis? How now were you viewing? Uh, what you had been through in the past as as in, to, in that moment uh, then, how were you making sense of those things? Well, some of it didn't make sense till later, honestly. Uh, it took several more years to like, kind of put all the pieces together. But um, I finally saw how sad I was as a child, how much... I was always really sensitive to both, you know, actual things with relationships and friendships and, you know, family stuff, but also like in spiritual ways and health ways and all kinds of ways, just very sensitive kid that had no, and like all of a sudden this contrast of what felt, I mean, they, they were my family at the time. They were, they were, you know, people that we went through that, this big process together. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of my like first teachers was someone who was much younger than me that started working at the restaurant. And um, she and I were the ones that created the home together, the Goddess Vortex and um, community house for like, I don't know, probably two or three years, this massive, you know, we had all kinds of events and whatever. I mean, not massive, but it was a good, a good little thing there in the mission in San Francisco. And her and I also ended up going to that school together that I'll talk about shortly. And, um, and then we worked together. So we were like, we were, yeah. and she had it's been like into this. it like mm -hmm. since she was young in her teenage years, she was deep, like really, really deep. And she taught me a lot already, like about, right. she was a yoga master at like a very young age. And you know, I don't say that lightly, like most people think they're much more, you know, like uh, knowledgeable in yoga, like, you know, than they actually are. Like there's like a true humility in some way, uh, not true, but like there's, there's a humbleness to, right. to mm -hmm. true yoga teachers. Um, and she was she knew a lot and um just yeah herbalist yeah. and all sorts of things so she taught me a lot in the beginning right. so this this place that you went to the school you went to is known as the hippie harvard <laughs> yes. um and this was uh this is kind of after this is where working at the restaurant uh -huh. at uh, cafe gratitude this is you end up at cia c-i-i-s C I I S. Okay. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Uh, yeah, it stands for the California Institute of Integral Studies, mm. and it's casually called Hippie Harvard. Um, there's a few other schools, sort of similar, like Naropa, and I forget some of the others off the top of my head, but um, C I I S in San Francisco right. is one of the most highly accredited within those types of schools. Um, and um, I got my completion bachelor's degree there. So I like literally got a degree in the new age. <laughs> yeah. And it would be like the, the who's who as far as yeah. uh, gurus. When you think about you know, like Abraham Hicks, like Dr. Wayne Dyer. Mm, they're more um, like authors. Like there was more. Um, right. You know, Stanislav Grof, he is um, sort of a, a Carl Jung type. Like, he has a whole field of psychology that s extends from Carl Jung. And I, he was one of my teachers. You know, I sat before him, him and Rick Tarnas, who does uh, archetypal astrology. And they've written books together. So they mix this whole realm of psychology that has very much so like acknowledges like the child's life in the womb and what happens and it's it's it's, it's long and it's complicated but i studied directly from the two of them sitting right in front of them for eight days in a row for eight hours a day and at the time because i didn't know any better i felt like i was sitting in front i remember i would tell people i'm sitting in front of jesus and buddha like they're telling me all the keys to the universe you know wow. and and that was just i mean one i had tons of teachers i the lead dream research um, person at Stanford. She was our lucid dreaming course teacher. Mm. Sylvia Nakesh, the very world renowned sound healing teacher um, and performer and whatever else. Um, gosh, uh, I took somatic psychology. I was in a master's class in women's studies um, with, oh my goodness, um, the list goes on and on of all these uh, tantric studies and by tantric studies i'm talking about the concept of the universe that's often misused in the new age um yoga studies oh uh, i took a course called a recent history in psychedelic drugs from one of the maps pr professors the multi-association for psychedelic studies mm -hmm. that are the the whole group that's like legalizing 
you know, mushrooms yeah. and everything all over the place. Those guys, those some of those guys are my teachers and everything at this school. It's connected to like Esalen, the big um, hub of essentially the new age that came through in like the what I want to say 50s and 60s down mm-hmm. there. And yeah, uh, yeah. Um, That's how the Enneagram got brought to the United States through Esalen. Es- that right there. Yeah. 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 I spent some time at Esalen. We didn't talk about this just the other day, but I was there briefly in that place. Whoa. That, right. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in a lot of different places, Pretty but wacky. that place is, I actually think it has something to do with like potentially, I mean, you know, I see things differently now, but at the time, like different land would have different mm-hmm. experiences. You know, when I'd be at a pyramid or I'd be wherever, like you'd have different experiences. And right. yeah. Well, well, I mean, even if you think, well, I'm just thinking, even if you, how much culture has just really right. popularized and is and is currently normalizing psychedelics and you know we'll, we'll maybe have some opportunities to talk about this as we're continuing to uh, unravel your story but mm-hmm. you know just to give an example uh you know joe rogan he's one of the biggest uh person who kind of promotes the idea of dmt use psychedelic yeah. use and, and has normalized it and it's talked about consistently with the different guests that he has in fact one of the uh, books that he just he literally, uh-huh. this is literally just an Instagram post about this book called uh, The Four that. Agreements, mm. which he's talking all about relation to psychedelic. It's not, do you rec- did you recognize the book? Or? Oh, I've read it. That used to be in my library. That's, really? <laughs> yeah, I actually still have to burn some books. Okay, <laughs> and it may right. still be in that collection of stuff. But right. um, yeah, no, that was definitely. And I actually know people that studied with with uh, Miguel Ruiz, like right. ongoing, like mm-hmm. that's one degree off from where I was. Yeah. Right. And just the reason why I'm sharing this post and maybe on this YouTube will maybe take a screenshot of this post by Joe Rogan, where he's, he's talking about this. This was something that was part of your integral study back then. It was mm-hmm. not as popularized now. And this, I mean, he's had, Joe Rogan has one of the number, pretty much the number one mm-hmm. podcast in the world. And this post itself, you've got, you know, over a quarter of a million likes. You've got mm-hmm. nearly 7,000 comments, people talking about how amazing it is. Right. So this is just something that it's important to realize that as we're discussing this, the more secularized a culture becomes, which is where we're at, there's this vacuum where these sorts of practices mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. become normalized just because people have that Jesus-shaped hole where they want to mm-hmm. fill in that void that's created by the secular culture. So, yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. Great. I love how you just said that. It's so true. I mean, you even see it in like clothes and everything now, you mm. know, just recently going to Marshall's and I, wow, every other shirt, not really, but a lot, you know, dream catchers and you know, astrology right. and, you Spiritual know, games, Target, Target <laughs> yeah. just right. like that. Yeah, it's everywhere now. I remember mm. when it actually happened. This is a total side note, but like years later, I remember being like in a Ross or something. And it seemed like overnight, all the clothes had indigenous patterns and it was just and i remember at the time thinking like wow the world's catching Mm. on you know i had this whole um that's so cool you know it's coming into the mainstream culture and it's funny because now i see what you just said is it's like actually because of the void it was just getting bigger and bigger that all this other stuff came in that was yeah, that's good. Yeah. Well, I went to spend each of my Ross. I went to a Ross Cup maybe like a year ago, mm-hmm. and they had a whole section when they were just a whole bunch of Ouija boards for sale. Uh-huh. What the heck? Just at a Ross. Yeah. North Phoenix. I often take pictures like of stuff that I find when I'm at stores. Uh, I have There's so much stuff, like especially you get, go around the holidays, yeah. and there's all these things that I'm like, wow, that's meant for kids. And okay. you know, and you just see it everywhere. Wow. All right. So you're in CIS, you're, you're doing all yeah. these different trainings, like the familiarity with a lot of you know people that are even more popular now, like right. amongst some of your books and things that you're studying. And uh, where did it go? from there or anything else you want to elaborate on well that time period of just the expansiveness so essentially it was kind of you know my whole i was closed off on some level even though i was very outgoing as a child and involved in all the scenes and popular and blah blah um there was a suppression and so all of a sudden i'm opening you know and it was just never ending i mean i was running off on vision quests getting all kinds of healing modality certifications i was going to burning man from right from the get-go like right after landmark like a week or two later i went to my first burning man i didn't even know what i was in for i went like seven times total but um i was running off to bali yeah do you want just real quickly i mean can you give a quick maybe three minute overview of what burning man is i know I remember when I first saw it, I didn't understand it. It was mm-hmm. all these people dressed in steampunk with this different weird architecture. <laughs> and you just, it was just mm-hmm. all over the place, is how I would describe it. But ha- it does is. It just explain maybe to the audience who doesn't know what Burning Man is. Just, it, yeah. Just help people understand sure. that. Um, 
granted, I stopped going right as it really exploded and became like more well known and popular. I think my last year was 2012 um, or 2013. Anyways, uh, it is a social experiment. It is a um, the, the speaking more so from what I saw when I was coming before Paris Hilton started going and all that, you know, um, it basically like they take money out of the equation out there. Like you can't buy anything and people think, oh, you're bartering. Not really. It's a gifting society. So you find somebody like, for example, these people showed up from Japan. They didn't even speak English. They had nothing. They had no water. They had no special shoes. Like your feet get messed up out there. You know, it's, it's a little bit Mad Max. Like you're like really having to tough hmm. it. At the same time, it's like a glorious party. At the same time, it's that um, sped up version of law attraction where it's just wild. So the gifting thing, somebody needs something, you give it to them. Bye, have fun, have a good burn. And then 20 minutes later, you lose your jacket and somebody else has like an amazing jacket and they just happen to want to give it to you. And it's like this whole thing of mm. like, like the whole create your reality thing. It's like amplified a bazillion times out there it's it's really uh interesting and then it's you know just tons of workshops of anything you can imagine i mean there's actually christians we know some i have friends that go out there to witness and stuff but um mm. uh it's every kind of workshop every kind of thought process you know um learning training camp of kind of food whatever like everything out there for example when I, the first time i went I went, went with cafe gratitude we had camp gratitude right like and we're telling people we're giving them their affirmations and giving them shots of noni juice and whatever now, i'm not going to say the explicitive word explicitive you know what i'm trying to say expletive yeah. expletive that word yeah. um but camp go <clears throat> yourself mm. was camped right next door to us huh so there's like literally a full spectrum of everything out there. I mean, there's like dead Barbie doll camp, like who knows why, but like dead Barbie doll camp, you know, every kind of camp. And then, so there's a big man in the middle and the man is essentially like an idol, if you will, of everybody's like basically kind of like putting their energy on the man of everything they want to let go all week. It's, it's huge and it's out there all week. And then on Saturday night, they burn it. Hmm. And... Um, like the wicker man, I believe it's called, kind of. That's what it reminds me of, yeah. Yeah. And then on Sunday night is the temple burn, which is totally different. Like the man burn on on Saturday night is, woo, you know, everybody's uh -huh. screaming and raging and letting go of all the things. And then the temple burn all week, people have been, it's the closest thing that you can find to like, like maybe what we get with God out there is um, at the temple all week, people are going and putting pictures of their deceased loved ones and things that are just like these, you know, their child that might have passed on or a uh, really humbling, you know, somebody's wedding gown that they got, you know, that they lost mm. their marriage, you know, these yeah. like the this like release, right, that we would do in repentance or something of that nature. And um, but they're putting these these like sacred things in the temple, like literally building layers of this inside of this massive structure. And then when the temple, ooh, I'm getting chills. This is weird. Um, <laughs> um, when the temple burns on Sunday night, um, it's it's like everybody's crying and they're silent and there's no screaming. There's no anything. People are hugging each other. It's like you know, it's the closest thing to it's like a counterfeit crucifixion yeah you know what i mean like it's they're placing all of their hopes their sins all these things on the on an idol and they're looking for salvation it's just what people do yeah. you know they're looking for god somewhere else and that's that's what happens you know yeah. that's it's really sad Almost it breaks is my but heart when i you're know saying that. yeah i think that's i just but also you mentioned you went multiple times so it's that i mean this is sort of like the state fair of you know, spirituality, which is, it's got everything. It's from, kind of a pilgrimage. It's yeah. like deep fried, yeah. deep fried spirituality from every <laughs> aspect where they try and deep fry everything. It's like a new age Mecca. I'm trying to, yeah. I'm it tr is. Right. It is. I mean, now, especially now, now that it's when I was, you know, I mean, it, it like somewhere towards the end of my experiences, people yeah. started understanding what it was and they'd be like, do you go to Burning Man? You're wearing one of those, you know, like we have those like belts, the utility belts that are all made from leather. Like you just had a look. People have a look out there. Yeah. Right? I mean, not there's tons of different kinds of looks because there yeah. is everything out there too. It's and definitely, there's... it's definitely extra in many ways. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely <laughs> a lot of extra. That's for sure. 
Definitely. For sure. Yeah. So just that, that was really just going after and just real quickly, I would just say, it just found yeah. interesting that, you know, there's all this accumulation on taking the past and burning the past and that's done with, but then you're back again the next year and the next year and the next yeah. year. So it's like, there's and no there's end in sight. Tons of stuff in between going on for all the people too. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I get think of this, this, so this continued to evolve and you're just going after one thing to another and you're talking about you're evolving and burning man. Yeah. You, when we were talking, you were, you, it was, there's aspects too of the past and, you know, your relationship with your parents, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and like I said, just, uh, not having a father who was there, uh, but not there. Um, there is sort of this father hunger that we innate, yeah. I think we all innately have as image bearers of God. I think all of us, I think in one way or another, I think all of our earthly fathers fail us on some level. Right. And then that, what do we do with that father hunger? And yeah. for you, uh, that would, do you want to talk about how, what happened as far as it goes in the new age? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, you know, lots of kind of like sacred tourism, if you will, that mm -hmm. kind of goes on through this area. But, um, I eventually ended up in, um, so I had had like a really bad ayahuasca experience, uh, actually with my Cafe Gratitude family on, oh, on, wow. on one of the islands. And, um, yeah, it was, it was horrific. It was a really, really bad. T tell everyone what ayahuasca is real quick. So it's a vine from, um, Central America mostly. I mean, it can grow in Hawaii and other places as well, but it's, um, it's a psychedelic, it's pharmacia, it's deep, deep, deep one. Um, I mean, there's lots of different ones, but that one is... It's not my favorite, honestly. And what's um, the purpose of it, taking it? Well, I would say people have all sorts of healing of some sort, healing of some sort to try to go into the parts of your potential psyche or spiritual body or different realms and try to heal things. And um, the like there's like Aya herself, you know, like there's a spirit mm. that you communicate when you're in these realms. And it's it's like. I would literally, I used to explain it to people when they'd be like shopping for different like psychedelic healing experience. I'd be like, are you, you know, every other psychedelic you've ever done, like wrap it in a, in like a spiral and then times it times 50. I mean, it's, it's super intense. And I, I have tons of experience in different psychedelics, but that one, it was not my favorite. Let me just put it that way. And, yeah. um, so I had had that negative experience and then I was afraid I was never going to do any like that kind of stuff ever again. But at one point, one of my teachers, so I had lots of mentors that just gravitated. I never, I never sought them out or anything, but people kind of took me under their wings at various points. And she brought me to a um, Native American church. And um, I have, again, a lot of respect incredible respect and love for this the, the, this person and this family essentially is what I ended up in um, but yeah uh, this church serves the um, Wachuma medicine which is the San Pedro cactus it's kind of similar to like peyote mm. and um, I preferred it much I mean I, I partook in that a lot over the next several years like a lot a lot a lot a lot of ceremonies actually assisted Mm -hmm. in a lot of the ceremonies and um i received some healing in those ceremonies absolutely but it was always lacking and there was a one ceremony where i was doing um you, when it's your turn you go up to the altar and you drink the medicine and you say your prayers and um you know the essential shaman of of the ceremonies you know helps you he also has a background in psychology he was a, med a trained medicine man but also um a background in psychology so it was it was a very unique container compared to like some native american churches and um yeah one day i was having a major healing about my dad and a lack of relationship in a way that might have hmm. felt good to any young woman you know and uh the man who ran this ceremony essentially adopted me as a spiritual father and <sighs> it's wild. I mean, like I said, I have so much love and care for this person and, um, um, but looking back on it, it did, you know, it helped in a way, I suppose, fill a void that was there. But when I got saved later, years later, obviously, 
I was like, wow, that's what he was trying to fulfill. And like, it's just not possible. There is no human fulfillment that can compare to God's love. And so, um, yeah, but I, it, you know, it, it made me feel a sense of belonging that I didn't know in my earthly realm on some level at that point. And, um, I, yeah, I'm kind of devoted my life to that church for a while. I mean, I was doing other things. I was actually living and apprenticing with a, so I was doing the, the medicine work as they call it with this man, the, my spiritual father and the whole, it was a big church in the Bay area there. And me still is, I believe. And, um, simultaneously over in Marin County, living and apprenticing with a Lakota elder, a woman who ran a school that was all about the indigenous arts, but more so from like um, dance and movement and breath work and prayer and things of that nature. So I had both ends of the spectrum really going at the same time throughout a whole, I think this was about 2012 by this point, maybe 11 or 12, somewhere in there. Um, and yeah, it was, it was impactful yet during that time period, I went to the Golden Gate Bridge and thought I was going to do something really stupid with my life. I was still deeply struggling Mm -hmm. on and off my whole life. I dealt with a lot of depression and suicidal thoughts and stuff like that. And I went there with that intention. Oh man. Would that be indicative too of a lot of people in the new age where it's sort of the there's a lot of sur- like a front almost where there's this all this sort of surface i'm we're happy and spiritual but de- de- yeah. a lot of them like deep internally they're struggling so i remember you know that's part of steven's testimony too with the mm-hmm. people that he was involved with in the new age he sort of saw the fact that they were almost living a double life where they're telling people this is what you need to do yeah to be fulfilled yet they're 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 internally struggling too, mm-hmm. and then we see both sides of the looking glass. That's where you almost start to have some cognitive dissonance with, okay, how legitimate actually is this, or yeah. where, like where what's the end game? How do I? Yeah, because at this point, I mean, you've you've gone to different places too, and maybe so. If anyone isn't solidified how much you're into it, because you're talking about the Golden Gate Bridge, just if everyone remembers, so right now it's 2021, and. You now everyone's talking about what's going on in the current states of the world and what that means for you know the end of, end of the world and everyone's sort of interpreting current events and their light and the, and within the lens that they're looking through. But 2012 uh, was a very interesting year. Uh, a lot of people oh. put emphasis <laughs> on that year. Uh, there was a movie made about it uh, <laughs> that was uh, pretty cheesy. I think with John Cusack and there's a point where it was just you know me and movies. Oh yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> Yeah, but for, yeah, for the audience, it was just, there's a whole movie made about it, about the Mayan yeah. calendar and things mm. like that. And But all joking aside, when you talk about someone who is a true believer and in aspects of the New Age, bring people into where you were in a t- 2012 real quick. <laughs> yes. So uh, even though it was not easy to get down there, another one of these pilgrimages, if you will, a uh, major one. Um, yeah, I got invited to be on the production crew at Chichen Itza, the big Mayan pyramid that's like in all the pictures um, for the December for 12, 21, 12, the like gateway that everybody, I mean, I don't know, not everyone thought, but we, we contemplated, we, some people definitely believed that we were going to shift into a 5d reality that, you know, we would ascend, that we would remember our Christ consciousness because of the alignment that was going on in the stars and the Mayan prophecy and blah, 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 all these, you know, um, earthly create, you know, celebrating the creation realms. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we went down there about a week, maybe 10 days before the big day and we're setting up a festival down there for what ended up being, gosh, I don't even know. I mean, not necessarily at just our festival, but people pilgrimage pilgrimaged from all over the world there for what was called like apocalypse tourism. Mm. I mean, they ran out of everything at the stores long before the actual date. Like that, those little villages down there could not handle, you know, the amount of um, gringos coming down and doing the thing, you know, <laughs> right. really. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was crazy. It was it was a gnarly production, but that's another story. Uh, but yeah, it was incredibly spiritual. It was, you know, all kinds of 
shamans and medicine people and teachers and seekers and new age new agers that didn't call themselves new agers because nobody does in the new age but um uh you know every kind of spiritualist you can imagine coming down there for the same purpose and you know there we are on Mm -hmm. on it was like four in the morning but the big night um and I was actually called up last minute into a ceremony. We were on the the elders' land, which like you could see the pyramid, but we weren't like right there. I'd spent a lot of time at the pyramid building up to this throughout the week, but um, and then we spent all day there. Everybody there was dressed in white. It was a whole thing. Tons of pictures on my mm-hmm. timeline of that. But um, yeah, you know, nothing particularly crazy happened i did see in like another realm like what seemed like you know something opening when i was there and because there were seven of us around this huge altar like the size of this table with sacred geometry and crystals and all sorts of stuff set up and we there were seven of us holding hands around it and you know we were all praying and doing the thing during to hold then you know the hundreds of people around us and the thousands of people on the land and you know it was like a, a thing and um and then we were like, well, we're still here, <laughs> right. you know, and um, yeah, what that ended up leading into was me going to Guatemala. And that was a whole other boatload of stuff, um, because basically, you know, there's all these people from all over the world. And a lot of them were just like me, had bought a one way ticket <laughs> mm-hmm. down there and, you know, nothing happened. OK, well, what's next? So we caravaned down through some various areas, but ended up on Lake Atitlan, San Marcos, um, in Guatemala. And there were so many people there. It's one of these hubs anyways of the new age, like we mentioned earlier. I forgot to talk about San Marcos, but it's a hub um, at any time. Right. But because of that particular year and everything, there were so many people there. And I was there for over a month. I don't remember exactly, five or six weeks every single day at least once a day sometimes up to three a day different types of ceremonies i called it ceremony college it Mm. was just wow you know everything from the combo the frog medicine to um my first experience with the dmt to Mm. um you know their cacao ceremonies the mayan like the mayan culture ceremonies song ceremonies everything you can imagine it was um What's that called? Kabbalah. There was a Kabbalah teacher down there. All oh kinds goodness. of stuff. <clears throat> All kinds of stuff. And whew, so that one, that changed everything, honestly. That was like, that was big. That was like a deepening of everything that I ex- experienced because, yeah, like all the volcanoes there and everything. It's it's an interesting. Like, yeah. And, and just and just real quick before well, we transition that, so people get just, I want, hopefully by now people understand that you are. I would say in like Flynn, like you were just, you were just all about that and then some. Mm -hmm. Um, And while we're, and and what's interesting too is that the way that God describes the world as that, you know, the Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creations, all things were created by him and for him, both in the earthly places and in the the heavenly places in the Mm -hmm. unseen realm. And there is an aspect too where I think a lot of these ancient cultures weren't just, making those designs just because like, oh, this looks kind of cool. You know, yeah. like I think a lot of them were tapped into mm-hmm. uh, some really bad sources and that's where they got a lot of their inspirations from and that every single God, every single religious system always demands sacrifice. Yeah. Um, and specifically uh, in the Mayan culture, if anyone knows just the basic history of it was blood and human sacrifice. Mm-hmm. What I found interesting when you were just telling me, just, just bri- briefly described real quickly that you even when you weren't a Christian, you went in those areas mm. and you could you, you could almost sense. Oh yeah, this is where it was. Just talk about that real quickly. Sure. So you know the pyramid, it was intense, but that was one energy that felt like something I I wanted to be around and to be a part of, at that stage of my life. And then you know these grounds, these Mayan grounds are huge. It's not just the pyramid, and there was a whole other area. And even from a distance, I was like what happened over there? I didn't know yet. Like nobody, we hadn't been on the tours or whatever to know what happened, but I could feel it like in the spirit realms and I didn't like it. The the human sacrifice and come to find out that's where they would take 
you know, the virgins and the babies and everything and do the sacrifices there. And I mean, then like Palenque, when we made our way through Palenque, it's even worse there and come to find I felt it like we literally ran through Palenque partly because we were trying to make it to the border. But um, I didn't like it there at all. Like some people stayed there for quite a while after we were at Chichen Itza and we were like, no, let's get to Guatemala. You know, it was mm. not something that I thought was cute. And yeah. So then eventually, you know, we go on tours and you hear about what actually happened. And I'm like, oh, see, I felt mm. it. Yeah. Um, and so, so all that in summary, so you're just going from one thing to another. And then you're at the place of the Golden Gate Bridge. I think that was a significant turn mm. where uh, just just talk about that really quickly. And then, uh, and, yeah, just talk about this very briefly when go ahead. When I was there. Yeah, the, uh-huh. the, the story about the Golden right. Gate Bridge, and, and there were things that happened with people that you were close to. Um, the, that was later on, but right. um, but yeah, I when I was there and went there with that intention, um, hmm. it was, I, the best way I could describe it at the time was um, that movie, I only remember movies from like my childhood. I I stopped watching movies somewhere pretty early on. Like, and, but anyways, that movie ghost at the end where there's like the, like creepy dark creatures coming out when the bad guy, I think Mm. if I remember correctly at the end, anyways, that movie impacted me as a child. It was really disturbing seeing those images. Well, that I literally saw something like that crawl out of my body and jump over the golden gate bridge instead of me. Hmm. And I remember at the, you know, you call these things entities in the new age, you would never say demons, but like looking back on it, like, I think it, it brought me there likely to do the thing. And then I don't know, maybe that was, Mm -hmm. I don't, who knows. Right. Which is just interesting because historically, I mean, the Golden Gate Bridge, it's, it's, it's representative, I think of just the, uh, the creative, like God has given us this ability as image bearers of God to think through and, and to create and to cultivate the mm-hmm. earth and so I mean the fact of how the Golden Gate Bridge is constructed like regular creatures and animals don't do that they just you know walk wall around and do whatever the animals mm-hmm. do but they don't make constructs like that so hmm. this thing that they built from the ground up was used to help people you know go back and forth one another but it's also it's become this sort of, you know famous yeah. landmark unfortunately where a lot of people have ended their lives. And so mm-hmm. I remember going to the Golden Gate Bridge on a tour. We did bike riding across. It's like back in 2010. And there's like signs everywhere, the yeah. suicide hotlines. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's what it's known for. And I remember just peer, going there and just peering over how far of a drop that is. Oh, yeah. Whew, it's, and I just, no just for a second, I just, I was having a good time. Yeah. But just for a second, I just thought, what? What goes in someone where they contemplate that, you know, and it's just, man. Well, it, it, it's interesting to me thinking about uh, in terms of your adolescence, like, let's say, mm-hmm. like, there's like alcohol use later on in your college years. That's when there starts doing some drug use and mm-hmm. things like that, like mushrooms. And all of a sudden your body's really sick after that. So you start doing this cleanse. Mm-hmm. Um my my question is were you were you fully off of drugs and sober during the time of your like your cleansing days going back now into uh psychedelics were you were, was there a period where you're totally sober i wasn't drinking is that what you're referencing like i i once i got into all this spiritual stuff i felt thought of alcohol as a very like low vibration you know mm. it was dirty it was not it was i was above it but you're still smoking pot yeah smoking oh, okay. pot like more earth-based stuff and and um and yeah psychedelics i would say definitely like okay. i mean not continuously i was often somebody that was sober when people thought i wasn't because of like my dance and stuff and that's a whole other thing but um mm-hmm. i would dance incredibly hard for eight hours at a time sometimes and people would be like what are you on and wow. i'd be like nothing spirit right. spirit you know yeah. and just very quickly because i don't know how much we went into this earlier um because we also want to get into where the story turned and, yeah. and you know for the better but <laughs> you were in something just so people don't i want to make sure i pronounce this correctly because it might sound like something that's not but it is a static dance which is yeah. s- specifically a new age thing that you got into just explain that very briefly and just yeah go ahead ecstatic not the other word that's kind of the same amount of syllables um it is generally speaking it is a between two and three hour journey of um a 
it's more they're more than DJs. They're like audio shamans. They're, they create like journey music that has a whole like up and down element up peak, you know, the ecstatic moment and then down. And then um, the general rules on the dance floor, at least when I started and stuff, was um, no talking on the dance floor, no shoes on the dance floor and no booze on the dance floor. Yeah. So generally sober environment. I mean, people might have smoked pot or, you know, had taken whatever some sort of like medicine is what most people call they don't call it drugs usually uh but something to that effect like in a ceremonial way in a spiritual way trying to connect to some source bigger than yourself um and yeah it's a prayer it's a ceremony it's a ritual it is uh, therapy it is what often i i mean i called it church mm. you know i called it it was it was my favorite out of every spiritual practice i was involved in that was my thing. That was where I found freedom the best that I could at that mm -hmm. point um, and had my therapy sessions and had my releases of, you know, I mean, sometimes for me in particular, I had no, I wouldn't hold back if it needed to be an ugly dance, if it needed to be a, you know, emotional dance, like it wasn't about choreography i mean i grew up doing like train dancing it wasn't i mean it might have been some of that as well but it was it was more an emotive um he release. healing mm. type thing there's always an altar created in the space yeah. you know it was it's uh, there's an intention set at the beginning usually some sound right. healing at the end all that kind of stuff and what and while there's a variety in, of new age practice of different new age practices and how they're carried out the one commonality they have is crossing over uh, to obtain whatever you're trying to attain, whether it's knowledge, whether it's peace, whether mm -hmm. it's that inner healing, you're crossing over to an area which biblically we have a place where Christ is the center of Christ is the healer. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in him. Amen. But there's also places that I'll call just no fly zones. <laughs> and regardless of your intentions, regardless of the fact that you know, you went through a lot in your life, a lot of legitimate traumas that have legitimacy that you crossed over into areas that God says don't do. Mm. That included the ecstatic dance. Mm -hmm. um, you want to just talk, just give one example about when it crossed over, like something else took over at one point? I was right away. My first festival, this was way back actually, like um, jumping around a bit, but in like 2007 or eight, um, yeah, I had I'd taken a bit of mushrooms at this festival and it was a, you know, you stay up all night dancing and it was this particular audio shaman, if you will. He plays like 40 instruments, brilliant guy, super nice guy, friend of mine back in those days. But anyways, his music is very special and his sunrise sets were like the most special thing at festivals. And so it was my first set of his mushrooms and my first festival. And I had, so I, I was a trained dancer all my life of all these worldly dances, like in a way I was, ex you know, exposed to paganism and such through Polynesian dancing, Middle Eastern dancing and stuff when I was little. So anyways, all these dance forms came together on this dance floor at my first festival because the music is very worldly. It has all kinds of different music mixed in with intentions and, you know, affirmations and all the things. And it was like, whoosh, okay, like here I am as a vessel, right? Literally as like a vessel for this dance to move through me. And then at some point I get trained as a Dakini, which that also has two different meanings in like the new age world. And I'm, I'm talking about as like a spiritual dancer. That's what that, you know, it's like a creative energy. Um, not doing it justice on like what the, the thing is, if you look it up, but um, not the other realm. Uh, but anyways, um, I, that's what I would do. Like before I got on the dance floor for all those years, I would literally ask the goddess to dance through me. Mm. <laughs> and would end up with whiplash literally and yeah. broken like toes and you know throwing out my back and knees that were popping out of a joint and all kinds of crazy stuff and um yeah so that was that was my practice really mm -hmm. it was it was like but it was this it was like war i was in this i mean <laughs> you think of spiritual warfare right. now but it was mm. it was this like um you're reaching for this spiritual nature but through these realms this 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Col- Colossians chapter 2 speaks about it. It mm. speaks about the elemental spirits of the world and not falling captive to them. And that there's a reason why later it talks about asceticism and severity to the body. Because all those, the, mm. although the, those things look appealing to man, man-made I mean, to man-made religion in that sense looks appealing to people because there's so much going on. You're putting so much force into it. There's a reason why God warns about it, though, very specifically, severity mm. to the body. It's like wow. that sacrifice can't appease God by any means, but okay. you're giving your body in, a, as in, an, in an act of worship to an entity. But to bring it back to the Golden Gate experience where yeah. I was asking the questions earlier about the, psych- the, uh, the psychedelics, so the Golden Gate experience, this was after the ayahuasca. This is after the um, the cactus uh, was this after the cactus Simultaneously. Drugs? Simultaneously. The, okay. After ayahuasca and, um, yeah, during the same window is I, cause I was sitting with the cactus stuff, like, you know, every weekend or every, every other weekend for like a year, okay. you know, I was with that all the time. And so it was somewhere in that zone, that same zone. Cause what, cause what I find interesting is earlier when you were talking, uh, when you were young, I being at like five or six having uh, suicidal ideation. Yeah. Right. And then I, and I, I want to see the silver, silver cord in throughout all of this because yeah. God is sovereign. He's been present throughout your whole life, guiding yeah. you to a very specific point and purpose uh, and even allowing things to happen to you to bring you to a point. Right. Mm-hmm. So what I find interesting is we have five, six. We see there's the spiritual uh, deprivation and needing of a savior, but instead having suicidal ideations in this form of like, a, you know, self-sacrifice. But then going to the point where you're living your whole life. And, you know, you're, you're learning so much, you're getting all this knowledge, supposedly you're going through all of this healing. Then it's like, God shows you real quick. He says, well, look where you are. Just yeah. like when you were five or six, you're right back here without me. Mm. It's just like the people at Burning Man, like Burning Man's been canceled since last year. And I believe it's canceling again this year, mm. right? Well, where's their sacrifice? Mm. They can't go and sacrifice anymore. Well, Christ is the once for all sacrifice to, right. to settle all of it. Right. The answer is already there, but I find that's what I kind of find interesting. It's like God's bringing you back to this place, mm-hmm. almost of childhood, yeah. saying like, "Look, look where what you're doing has brought you." What, where were you in that mindset at the Golden Gate Bridge? Like all of a sudden, you've been through so much in your life, you've experienced so much, but you're right back to when you were five or six years old. Like, what, what did that do to you? Um. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I. Honestly, I don't have a total recall of what it was like after I left the bridge. Like, it's a mm-hmm. bit of a vague memory. I think I felt relief that that thing went instead of oh. me. Um, but what that just reminded me of is in the same day that I was adopted by the spiritual father father in the medicine ceremony, he was like, you're just like a big wounded little girl, aren't you? Like, not in like a bad way. He was just seeing, like, I mean, he was a shaman if I ever saw one he wouldn't call himself one but I could see him seeing (laughs) Mm -hmm. and um yeah he saw us in there and he could see me as that little girl that had walked away after from wound after wound after wound over wound and had like found that moment with him so Hmm. yeah that's interesting Mm -hmm. Hmm. yeah and so you get to a point and I want to be careful with how I structure this because we have a large audience and you know, yeah. it would suicide is a real thing that a yeah. lot more people struggle with universally, both Christians, non-Christians. It's, it's sometimes it's even, even amongst the Christian world, it's a very taboo thing to talk about, Yeah, but it's something that a lot of people struggle with on a regular basis. And especially now you think of the astronomical suicide rates that have escalated since, since COVID happened mm-hmm. with the isolation and the quarantine and yep. a lot of people losing their livelihoods that they spent years to build. Um, but that played a part with someone that you are close to, mm-hmm. which led now. And also while we talk about this, it's also, I want to say that, this area of darkness still was a catalyst to bring you mm-hmm. to an, to an area where we're going to get to, mm-hmm. but it was someone that you were close to. Yeah. I just talk about that real quickly. So people yeah. kind of get an understanding, you know, given the background, and everything that you've been through. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was actually a little while later, but there was, there was some different darkness stuff that happened. And then I eventually ended up on Kauai, um, in early 2018 and a friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, um, 
who I sat in those ceremonies with, and she was with me at the pyramid down there in Mexico. And um, she was successful in what I went to that bridge to do that day. She went there. She was a very, you know, respected, well, like long time yoga teacher. And I think I want to say she was a therapist. She was, she was of a well-loved community and, you know, person that had some professional aspects to her and all that. And she was suffering and, um, yeah, she did basically the same thing. I, I, I had gone there ahead of time and picked my location and all that. Like it was like, it wasn't just like a spur of the moment and she did the same thing and yet she succeeded. And, um, hmm. so, and that was one of many, like she, she was, I think the second person in my life. I mean, I was close to her, so it was hard, but, um, I probably know at least a dozen or more people that have mm -hmm. either taken their own life or mm -hmm. gone out in some strange way that a lot of that really started to make me question what was going on in that scene. Cause a lot of these people were well known as one of them incredibly like she was famous and successful and all the things when, when she was my teacher, she was like a barefoot hippie, but years later she was making gosh, I don't know, $10,000 ahead on her workshops and stuff that she would do. I mean, she was super successful. Wow. And, um, yeah. So, but the one over the bridge, that was, that was hard, really hard and hard for our whole community. Um, cause mm. not just community on, I mean, honestly, like I was part of the global community of this stuff and so was she. And, you know, so, I mean, it, it it's like ripples like huh. that when these kinds of things have happened and yeah so there's yeah. like a whole window yeah yeah and just you know too like uh we wanted just just for the sake of time that this is a whole progression of things uh and that was ultimately a lot of this started got to a point where you just started just questioning a lot of things about the reality yeah. around you. And you would just say just vague, just vaguely, you just started doing like a lot of research kind of going down, mm -hmm. down the rabbit hole. And, oh, yeah. and a lot of times when people do, and this is a byproduct too, of just recent events, you know, the last mm -hmm. year, you know, since March, 2020, where people are trying to make sense of the world. And there's mm -hmm. a level where you can go down rabbit holes where it almost becomes this fragmenting yep. occurs. And that can either be a good thing or a bad thing. But in this particular case, that was part of mm -hmm. really your journey just to explain just a little bit about that mm -hmm. and, and what the next progression step is yeah. and so yeah um just previous window to being on Kauai I was seeing various aspects of the festival world and my life in Nevada City and these things where I was I don't know exactly where I got it from but I was like wow these people are chasing a light it's very luciferian Right. Huh. Right. I could see it on some level, but I didn't understand it quite yet. And so I started jumping down dark rabbit holes. I mean, I was a truther since like 9-11. You know, I'd been like looking at things in a different perspective or whatever, trying mm -hmm. to trying to figure out the truth. Mm -hmm. Right. And but anyways, at that point, jumping, jumping, jumping into all kinds of stuff. And I'm not going to go into them for the sake of time right now, but like as far as you can go down the rabbit holes and Essentially, I got to what I, the way I've put it is the bottom of the rabbit holes always like it's dark, it's slimy, it's intense, right. you know, there's, there's lies, there's deception, there's, there's all the things like as bad as it gets. And I was like, whoa, Satan's real. Mm. I had always seen this like puppet like hands oh, wow. above darkness things mm -hmm. in the new age. Like, you know, when I'd be in other realms or at festivals, I could see these things anyways. So. I at the bottom of that rabbit hole when I met Satan, like I feel like I actually like met the like the depths of the depths. I said, Well, if he's if Satan's real, does that mean Jesus is real? Wow. Like it's a hardcore shift. Right. Quickly. Mm -hmm. And I was totally comfortable in my twelve years of Christ consciousness at that mm. point. Like it was not, you know, um, but it was again one of these things where looking back the pieces were starting to come together. So I'm on Kauai. Um, oh. Well, the, didn't you have a moment too? Yeah. Because a big part of your history, I was just yeah, thinking yeah, about yeah, this. Yeah, 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 This is important. Is, again, emphasis, the ecstatic dance. Yes. You are 
and this is a point too where we want to talk about just an aspect of how this is God's sovereignty and all of it about how he reaches and draws every single unique person to himself. But uh, and I'll just read this too as a paraphrase to this um, is this is uh, Acts. And I was sharing with this, this with you the other night. I remember like a, you know, my, eyes are, my mind's blown. Right. And it's talking about uh, Paul, Paul's talk on Mars Hill. He says, and he made from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Mm. The context, though, think about the context of that. Mm -hmm. You're doing, you're on a dance floor. Mm -hmm. You're doing a static dance. My bring, bring people into what happened. Yes. One of my favorites. Um, so, yeah, I was in the ending where it's very just, you know, you've gone through that explosive and you're in that like sweet, sacred, like nectar, you might call it at the end. And I had my eyes closed and it was very prayerful and slow and movement. And I felt um, like your whole thing with that is to feel like empty. It's strange, but like, you know, that kind of like meditation or something, that emptiness, like just to clear it all away. And so I found that clarity and then poof, I had my eyes closed, but... I knew it was Jesus right there before me and I couldn't see his face. His face was shining like the sun. I didn't know scripture at all. This is all like, and, um, I saw a long robe and I saw sandals and it was like familiar yet. What is this? Something that didn't make sense. Really? This, impactful moment and um i proceeded to learn this kind of like that verse like the, in like a felt way like this this wasn't like i necessarily heard words but he showed me all kinds of stuff i have it all listed here and i have it all backed with scripture uh but i'm just gonna say a few for time purpose um he showed me that he is the center of all existence much like um colossians 117 i believe it is um and then um, that he created everything. And I have two different verses for that. Revelations 4.11, um, Ephesians 3.9. Sorry, my list is a little messy. Um, that he is why everything exists. So that goes over to the author of life in Acts 3.15. The list goes on and on. He, he showed mm. me about 20 different scriptures, really, like... Down the road, I checked this all with scripture to make sure it was really him. He did take me into the new earth. I didn't know what that was. I mean, I had a new age idea, but this was different. There, and, and I was shown that there'd be no tears, that there'd be no hunger, that there'd be no death. Um, all these realms, right? And I mean, the list goes on really and really. Right. No violence, no... I mean, I didn't know what sin... Mm. I didn't acknowledge sin as a real thing, but that's essentially what I was shown, that it was just... Yeah, and but just so you know too, this is the point where you're still you're still seeing this still through those new oh, yeah. age filter. Almost in the sense you think about Paul's conversion when he has like the scales fall off of his eyes after he's blinded after seeing encountering the the risen Lord on the road. Right, yeah. you're still viewing yeah. this experience. And again, this is a point too when you look at uh, in First John four and it says test the spirits for not every single spirit that testifies is of God. Like that 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 passage assumes that there's false spirits and there's true spirits that testify hence the term testing yeah. how do you differentiate between the two and the question is scripture i mean walter martin yeah. talked extensively about that in several of his lectures um about what spirits testify of the risen lord and which ones are counterfeit yeah um so it's important to differentiate between that but you you had said that you because of where you were you kind of still still sort of wrote that off i thought I reached a new level of Christ consciousness. You know, I thought I was being shown something that was I, I, the best I could make it make do of it. Yet it stuck with me. I kept it kept coming back up. And I knew one, one beloved Christian woman in my town that I was living. She worked at the health food store. And one night I got the opportunity to ask her, can I tell you a story? Told her the whole thing. Very sweet elderly woman took off her little spectacles, put them on the end of her nose, grabbed my shoulders, pulled me in close and said, tree, because that's what everybody used to call me. Because one of the 
things that he showed me was that he lived at the center of all existence and he was like he showed it to me on my heart and um and i said so if jesus is the center of all because i was pretty convinced that was real whatever i had seen i said does that mean <laughs> that the goddess is everything else around him uh this sweet little woman working at the the grocery store she grabs my shoulders and says tree Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only <laughs> real truth. And everything else about this goddess is a lie straight from the enemy. Wow. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And um, so it shocked me. <laughs> and then she basically proceeded to put a little care package together with a book and some YouTube links and a uh, track in there and, you know, stuff like that. And I came and picked it up and it started the process i remember looking at that track at one point and being like this is a big deal you know i could tell like you know the idea of the cross and everything like it, it crossed my mind um but i wasn't there yet went off to Kauai. things you know proceeded to both be awesome in my island life and also dark there was a lot of overlapping much like the life there um and yeah i um the living situation I was in, the work situation that I was involved in, basically, I ended up having some betrayal, some the, the, the man that I was dating, various things all at once sort of started just really just not good. Some stuff, various things, you know, taken advantage of and all kinds of things. And um, it was enough to basically like start oh i skipped bypassed a whole important thing which was um so the youtube list that the woman had given me from the store it created the algorithms and i had come across stephen bancars oh cool yeah yeah because he started researching christian stuff so it slowly went from yeah it went Christ, from like, consciousness yeah. meditation kundalini awakening your to youtube's like, being regenerated exactly yeah. <laughs> this, was, this was and it was like they were better back then the algorithms were better they right. would now. take you in the right directions um so yeah, Stephen, and it was funny because it was Stephen destroying this painting who was an artist friend from my new age days, very well-known artist. That was the first thing I saw of his. And I would be like, why is he destroying this like incredibly valuable painting of a friend of mine that's, you know, it's only a beautiful sacred painting. Right. And that was enough to me, go check out his page, see his testimony, see his the rest of his stuff. So I started listening, but was only agreeing with parts of it and whatnot. You know how it goes in the beginning. I was a tough tough cookie um so you know and some other christian youtubers as well uh that like face like the sun gones and a few others that like have this like fringy topic stuff but then also are christians and i would take bits and pieces of it but kept moving with it um so anyways back to Kauai. i'm on Kauai. i had lost quite a few friends from like my friend on the bridge that was mm. while i was on Kauai, and quite a few other intense losses um questionable living with some people working with some people everybody it, it got it got really intense on the island so I, I basically had posed a question jesus if you're real like i need you will you show yourself to me like will you prove that you're real like it was kind of a little bossy compared to what i would do now you know but um it wasn't long after that he started placing went people in my life that were at least reading the Bible had a Bible. Maybe they were still involved in some like new agey type stuff, but um, all these really unique things, people inviting me to church out of the nowhere when mm. I, you know, um, uh, I was drawn to a church. They gave me a Bible. So I had a Bible, which, you know, it was on, like I didn't read it, but it was there. Um, this was like November of 2018. And, um, and then yeah, like just playing like I was boxing up all my like new age stuff and putting it away and seeing what that felt like. And I was realizing like, I don't need that stuff like it. But maybe that's a distraction. You know, like I was just having these kind of epiphanies slowly and, um, you know, a bracelet that I had that was from my ama devotee world, like the ashram. It was given to me. I wore that thing for eight years or something and it never broke and it was supposed to break it was a wish break bracelet it broke the same day i asked jesus i said if everything else is fake in that other world will you show me something 
and that bracelet finally wow, broke after all those so years cool. the very yeah, same day that, yeah. that's so cool and yeah so and then you know there was some scripture honestly like through people watching people's um channels like stevens and various people and i remember the first verse that like really had an impact me on me and is um the heart is deceitful and wicked mm. What's the rest the of it? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. Yeah. I was like, no way, because in the new age, it's all about opening your heart and following your heart and like being your bliss and all that self-love. And I'm like, I have a big, huge open heart. Wait, I can't trust this? What is it? Like, I, it, it stumped me. It was just like, mm. wait, what? Mm-hmm. And then also the, the you know, the, the verse that like God's law is written on our hearts, you know? So mm. it was like, oh, wait, what is how does that compare to what I just read, you know? And then the one that was like, ba bam, ba bam, was um, <laughs> Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Mm, it's in Corinthians 11. Yeah. 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 11, 15, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whoo, that one, I mean, everything you play with, like whether it's a star being or your ancestors or, you know, a spirit guide mm. or um, the psychedelic realms, like all of it is light. Like you're or, playing with well, light. They'll, they'll, a lot of times they'll identify themselves as light workers. That I too, mean, light just, workers. Historically, I mean, I just for re, I mean, just for research, you know, there's mm-hmm. certain times I'll follow, you know, different new age Instagram accounts just to kind of understand the language barrier and how they articulate mm-hmm. what they're trying to get across and mm-hmm. i've seen countless times they'll refer to themselves as light workers yeah, oh yeah i was so <laughs> yeah yeah mm-hmm. so the, i can see how reading something like that from scripture would just it would just all of a sudden there just be this shift or other edge of the looking glass as far as how you're viewing that in light yeah. of everything you viewed and practiced in your past right and just um that whole segment where i was jumping through dark rabbit holes like getting that like wait a minute you know seeing the connection there of the deception essentially of things mm-hmm. that and you know my friends chasing the light in in the new age that i saw the luciferian thing it was like mm. click you know one of these click moments and so yeah um there was a night that i really needed refuge i was in a tough situation on the island and i prayed out to jesus at this point i was basically like i was i was experimenting i was like okay something's real and i said i need help like i need a, i need a new place to live i was in between some situations and the next morning this sweet elder man who had only briefly met me. He knew something was going on that night before. And he drove down and he came to me and he said, I know this is weird. You don't know me, but I feel like you need a safe place to stay for a while. Wow. And he ended up being like an uncle, like family, you know? And um, so that was a few months of that. And I was kind of cushioned in my life. But then ultimately towards the end of my experience staying at his house, living's really hard on Kauai. It's not yeah. easy to find, you know, places to stay and stuff. And it's very, very expensive. It, and also just what you're talking about earlier. And this, we experienced this in our plant there that mm-hmm. as beautiful as it seems, it's very dark, but also there's a very astronomically high suicide rate too. Yeah. Um, which is something for people to be aware of. So, yeah. but your living situation, you're there and you finally have a place to stay. Yeah. And go ahead. Safe, amazing. You know, uncle, he's such a great guy. I mean, he wasn't a believer. He was, but he was listening to my journey and kind of poking fun at me. You know, we had, we had a very fun relationship and, um, and yeah, so towards, he, he, he let me know, I don't know, maybe a few weeks ahead of time that his uh, family was coming to visit from the mainland. So he needed my room back. And um, so here I am going back into the potential of unknowns and it was causing me great anxiety for over a week. I was waking up every night about 3 a.m. in the morning with just like peak level anxiety and I pulled out everything from my bags of tricks for a whole week. You know, meditation, yoga, breath work, tantric practices, CBD, um, yoga, dare I say that, grounding. I would go out and sit on the earth. I'd go to the beach. You know, I would say my affirmations. Um, the list goes on and on. Everything, all the things that I that I knew how to do, I would do and nothing would work. Nothing would work. It was just this like I would often just fall asleep like watching to some stupid thing on YouTube or whatever it was, you know, and and then it was the very night the morning essentially that I had to move out it was a Friday and uh (laughs) that was like the fifth morning at least that I woke up with this anxiety at 3 a.m and that morning 
instead of reaching for any one of the thousands distractions, I picked up the Bible that I had been given some four months earlier. And wow. I had never gone back to that church in like four months. I'd been there a few times in the fall. So I picked up, I have it down there actually. Um, I picked up that beautiful green Bible and um, put my hands on either side of it and said a prayer or something like, Jesus, I really need help. Can you show me something in this book that will help me? And I had my eyes closed still. And I, you know, open the pages wherever it may be, put my finger down like this, open my eyes. And the very first three words is above Matthew 6, 25, that chapter, uh, or... Yeah, it's like the chapter descriptions, right? Yeah, and okay. right. So the little like um, subtitle or whatever. Do, it was an NIV, NIV Bible, do not worry. Mm. And those three words, I had a supernatural experience with the Bible. Those three words literally like jumped out of the Bible and through, like sifted through me in a way that gave me a peace that surpasses all understanding wow like immediately within seconds and i was shocked and then i just was like hmm okay thank you jesus you know like was that huh mm -hmm. you know <laughs> and what is happening the exclamation point goes above your head yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely yeah. a moment and so I went back to sleep, great, woke up, packed up my life, didn't know what I was doing, went and sat in the van to try to figure out the next step and um, was prepared, you know, for anything at that point. And uh, I did the same thing, put my hands on the Bible and said, you know, Jesus, it seemed to work earlier. Is there something you want me to do next? And I kid you not, in that exact moment, I get a ding text message on my phone and it's the woman who was from the church months ago that they had given me the Bible. Mm -hmm. And we had made friends, but we hadn't talked in at least four months. And out of the blue, she messages me and she's like, hey, Tree, you know, we have a visiting pastor on the island tomorrow. I think you'd really appreciate his message. Like, why don't you come? And I was like, okay, I'll be there. And so I go the next morning and they're set up at, um, not at the church, but at this outdoor location right by the ocean. And, uh, I walk up and sit with my friend and the sermon gets going and the pastor, he's up there and he's passionate and delivering the message and he gets to, for God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son that <laughs> those that believe shall not perish and goes on, you know, and I, it was the first time that I ever really heard the gospel. Oh, wow. Like I had digested like, yeah, okay, whatever. This Jesus guy might have died on a cross, whatever. But like, you know, like it wasn't, it never landed. I never mm -hmm. really heard the gospel until that moment. And brothers, I like just r immediately, the weight of his glory, like my hands went up. I was weeping. I was crying. I was shaking. I was repenting. I didn't know what repentance meant, yeah. but I'm sitting there begging him for forgiveness, knowing that he was true. There was not a doubt in my body mm. that he was true and that I needed to surrender my life to him. And it was both like, I felt just like, so humbled and and like that 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 forgiveness the repentance like yeah like just a sinner i knew i was a sinner and also felt like i could taste his promises and his love and his mm. truths and all the things it was this beautiful mm -hmm. like everything i had ever been seeking in the new age right then and there in that moment it, i mean there's more but like that was the beginning of what i was really seeking i finally was tasting truth mm. Yeah. Wow. And so, yeah, the woman that was there with me that had invited me, she was a midwife. And afterwards, she's like, are you okay? And, <laughs> and I'm like, I need to be baptized. And I didn't really understand, like, you know, the salvation right. and then baptism thing or whatever that they were 
I meant all of it. I meant I'm in. And so just like that, people were running off to the church to get the baptism robes. People were going to get their instruments to be able to sing the hymns. People were, you know, going off and getting towels from their car. And, you know, I was calling like the few Christians and my parents and stuff that I knew, telling them what was about to happen, throwing some of my new age stuff in the trash in the bathroom at the beach. And it was it was just like that. And the elders walked me through what it meant to give my life to Christ and um, and then they all walked and these people barely knew me right. I had attended like two services before and they were just so amazing immediately immediately brought into the body of Christ in a way you know being a part of all the things I was a part of like you know thinking I was connected to the most loving unification people like immediately the body of Christ just brought me right under the in and yeah, so they baptized me right there in the ocean, like yeah. super beautiful. And and this is what my favorite <laughs> part too. So if you're fan, if you're fans of cultish, you know that we are under the umbrella of Apologia Studios. Uh, there's a certain uh, person that's part and it's part and parcel essential to the studio, and we wouldn't be here really without him as Pastor Luke the Bear Pearson. Shout out to Luke, uh, the giant big bear. <laughs> he just happened to be on the island that time working on some church planting stuff and he just so happened to be on the beach exactly where you were that's nuts and if, very, if anyone knows Luke uh, you know that he just when he gets excited he just is like all giddy and so I remember you said in the giddiest way he's like Luke, Luke someone's getting baptized and he like fidgeted for his phone <laughs> and pulled it out yeah um, I mean notice that he was filming you yep wow he just happened to be right there and I had never heard of you guys. I yep. didn't know who Apologia was or any of that. And um, yeah, so That's eventually nice. it was like first person finding this out too. It was really cool how I found out, but we might have to save that story. But yes. um, but uh, yeah, you guys have basically, this church, like in some way have been there since the very beginning. That's so crazy. the fact that wow. I'm here some two plus years later is... My it, mind is being blown right yeah. now. Yeah, God's amazing. Well, His yeah. providence is Praise amazing. Praise the Lord that you can use all of this together. I mean, we're all yeah. just yeah, we're all in the same boat. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And yeah, here amen. We are just exemplify and talk about how good He is. So, mm-hmm. so you're there, and and you're you know you get baptized. You have this conviction of sin, and you shared with this with me last night. Is you know one of the things that New Agers have the conviction to do when they come to know the Lord, and you saw this in a very. Ex- eccentric way in the book of Acts and I believe mm-hmm. in Acts 19 where they, at Ephesus where they basically make a bonfire of idols yeah. like they're they just there's a subtle conviction amongst people who come to the new age that I just have to get rid of this stuff yeah um, and, but also it was like this motive you had behind and I'll just set you up for it is that it wasn't like you were afraid of God but you you realized that this had hurt his heart is that how you elaborate how you said it that your involvement with the different New Age practices, that oh. this had hurt God's heart, yeah. is the way you described it. At least that was your vantage point, right? Yeah, I was um, deeply humbled. Uh, you know, I feel like now I could put words to it like it was grieving his spirit. Um, all the other stuff that I was doing because I was trying to seek spiritual fulfillment, because I was trying to connect to something bigger than me, because I was... I was doing what I could out of love. I wasn't, you know, a dark person intentionally or anything of that nature. But now I knew that that was essentially separating me from the one true creator, our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And he frowns upon all these other spiritual realms. And you cannot combine Jesus with the rest of these other spiritual realms. Like I, I went, I, I, ver- I took it very seriously mm. and went from being, you know, deeply open in all the spiritual realms to asking the Lord, like, shut it all off. I don't want to be, I don't want to see in those realms anymore. Take away every Mm. gift, I'm using air quotes, that I had in the new age. Take it all away, Lord. I don't want any of that anymore. And he did. It was like that. Like, I went from seeing in, like, technicolor every, like, colors we can't even see in this realm, you know, like, multiple dimensions all the time. Like, I just lived in those kinds of worlds to gray it wasn't even black and white it was like gray for quite a while and my my walk with the lord was like just getting in the word and prayer and doing my best to find good fellowship and churches and all of that and um you know but now i know him as you know the creator of the universe like he is 
he is he mm. is far superior than any of those other realms. It's just very different. Yeah, he'll fulfill that desire in mm-hmm. every aspect in himself and yes. in his word and in his relationship with you. Is and per- in his timing. In his timing, he's yeah. purging you of all of those other things. Mm-hmm. It's so cool hearing all the awesome connections. Like you live a a complicated life, always learning but never growing in your knowledge of the Lord. Meeting yes. the simple old lady that had known you since you were young, yeah. giving you like, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. All these yeah. things are not the truth. Stop it. This like beautiful, simple lady. And then all of a sudden there's the midwife who helps bring people into the world. Right. God gives her the gift of seeing someone be born again spiritually yeah. right in front of her eyes. Yep. It's just so cool how God just, I don't know, how he just brings it all together. It's yeah. blowing my mind right now. Everything's yeah. going like, psh, 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 psh. So, so cool. It's so awesome to to hear that. Your, your testimony of God's grace. It's just a beautiful thing. Yeah. I feel like there should be a movie about it. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, hopefully one day, maybe he'll have me write, write a book or who yeah, knows, there whatever, you go. whatever he wishes, right. yeah. you know, it's not, it's not about me anymore of it's course. for him. And, you know, even this isn't easy for me here now, but right. it's what will glorify him. So Amen. he deserves it. He is worthy. So, you know, That's go right. to whatever links he he asks, I'll show up to the best of my ability. That's, Speci- all, that's all we can do, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he yeah. shows up and makes up the rest. That's what that's he's been trying true. to do for you your whole life. He's like, here I yeah. am. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> of course, it. and of course, we, it feels like these last two hours, though, have just flown by. I know. And there's so much, there's so much more that we could elaborate on. Mm-hmm. But I think we're going to have a very diverse audience here. But I, I want to just take a moment for anyone who is in the new age, mm. who is or just in any of those practices, you know, you have it, you, you're saying you, you get a lot of interesting friend requests and, and mm-hmm. these, these are a lot of people you didn't necessarily name it. There's just a lot of people that you do know. Mm-hmm. Um, real, actually real quick. I almost totally forgot. Um, just Russell Brand. Oh. I totally forgot that story. Wrap up. Tell the story real quick and oh, then, we'll, then we'll wrap things How up. How many here. minutes do I have? Okay. Uh, goodness. So when I was working for a global meditation campaign up in Portland, um, we decided we, we were praying one night for different guys in our new age community that we thought were leaders and, um, they were, I guess. And Russell Brand came into the conversation and my friend and I realized we were both like super intrigued by who he was, his, his humor and all the things. So we looked him up, his, his website or whatever. And he was like touring, like in our region. So we went to Vancouver. I think we saw him first in Portland, but then we went to Vancouver and we, found a way, you know, like the meet and greet kind of thing afterwards. We we found our way into this, I don't know, 40 or something people that were waiting to meet him. <laughs> and my friend and I were both extremely outgoing performers and teachers and all these things in the new age. And we basically led these 40 people that would have stared at a glass wall waiting for Russell to come out. It took over a half an hour through like a mini festival. I mean, we had them doing all kinds of singing together and body part twister. And I mean, you name it. We were like entertaining them, using weird accents, convincing people we were from other. I mean, it was it was we were like a show, essentially her Mm -hmm. and I ourselves. And so it was this whole thing. And then towards the end, I don't remember if it was her or I that came up with it, but I was like, one of us was like, let's ohm for Russell when he comes out, all of us ohm at him. And you know, you're like in one of those like little cages, kind of like the little fences they put outside of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we're all in this like little herd together thing. And he come, eventually he comes, it's like a, a thorough pass where like, the, you know, the little wind room or whatever outside of a building. And he stops to hug one of his people. <laughs> we're all standing there. My friend mm. and I were right in the front. I used to wear this rainbow serpent weechel, like these mm. huge medicine necklaces from yeah. Mexico. He comes out and he's staring, he's hugging and he's staring right at me while we're all just going for it, making the ohm noise at him again and again and again and again. <laughs> you know, he's got those like eyes. Yeah. yeah. And um, he is like locked right on me and he walks straight up to me and he goes like this and he's like, hello. <laughs> you know? yes. And and I'm like, hello again. You know, like playing the whole like yeah. um, reincarnation or whatever right, soul right. family card. Oh, and he was like, yeah you know like he was like yeah i get that and um so um it proceeded to be this whole like 30 minute experience and i essentially was like i was right there next to him he has that sekhmet tattoo on his arm and i was like opening the the like 
I mean, he was so loving. He was so sweet. He's like bending over, meeting the guy in the handicapped wheelchair and signing yeah. the person's poster and uh, taking the picture and doing all the things. And all I was just trying to help him. And he kept like turning around and like thanking me. It was this whole thing. Yeah. And then like at the end, he like gave me a kiss on the cheek. And <laughs> I had yeah. a crush on him at the time, yeah. you know, super smart guy. Anyways, yeah. I gave him a crystal and that was that. So yeah. that well, was... just Yeah, and just goes to show that there are just a lot of, you know, we all cross, you know, different paths and different people and things like that. And that all of us are in the same place that all, everyone needs the gospel, including Russell Brand and Russell, yes. by chance you hear this, yes, we Russell. love you, man. We're, we're praying for you. And, totally. uh, yeah, yeah, we definitely, that would, we, we care for you. And yeah. as I'll say this, so just, just really quickly in summary, as we wrap up just one last thing for anyone who's in the new age, from anyone, from one of your past friends, someone who's a younger, uh, who's trying to maybe make sense of the world who struggled because of COVID. They haven't really had a huge, this has yeah. been their first like real trial as a young person, you know, kind of dealing with the weird brave new world that we're all dealing with, or just someone like Russell Brand or really anyone who's, who's into this. Can you, could you just explain now, given your resume that you've kind of laid out and your experiences of all these things in comparison to Jesus, to really, mm -hmm. truly knowing him mm -hmm. uh, in the most personal way possible. Because that's the beauty of the gospel. It's, not, it's great to have your sins forgiven and to be righteous before him. But the end goal of the gospel is that we get God. Yeah. We get relationship with the creator, the triune creator of the universe. Um, if you just could speak to them just real quickly and just articulate your heart, given your experience, just I want to give the floor to you as we wrap up here. Mm, okay. Yeah, well... Um purity like he's pure he is he is full he is pure he is truth um so many things in the new age you think you find your way into these things but there's always that next that next thing that next workshop that next training that next yoga class that next whatever like that next piece you know and he is you know like it's it's it's, it's a depth that there's no comparison and a love that is fulfilling, that is al alive, that is um, beyond anything. And that's the thing that, um, you know, I used to think it'd be boring to be a Christian or something like that. And yeah, I mean, you, you give up certain things as a Christian to walk with the Lord, but what he gives, oh. Nothing in all my 13 years of searching under every spiritual rock under the sun, practically. I'm sure there was a few that I left out, but most of it. His love, his, his, oh, <laughs> there's no, you can't, like the whole thing, all those 13 years cannot add up to who he is even but for a moment. A few moments at his feet in true humbleness can't compare to the infinite realms that I explored, the bazillions of dollars I spent, the all of all that whole other world it seems like like dust, like nothing compared to his truth. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's 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 so encouraging to hear. You know, I think about just as we all have heard, you think about like Paul in Philippians three, where he gives out his whole resume. Mm -hmm. He says, "I." count this all as nothing mm -hmm. a scuba yep <laughs> as just versus knowing jesus christ my lord so uh, i just want to wrap it up so i just want to just kind of end it on that note so uh sure. so yeah uh, if you guys have enjoyed this episode i am thank Teresa. thank you for driving all the way out from california to come yeah. on here and, thanks for having uh, me absolutely and so if you enjoyed this episode uh please share this on social media leave us a comment let us know what you thought and leave us a review on itunes whether it's one star or five star always grateful for the feedback and as always a program like this cannot continue without your support so if you feel led to partner with us you can go to the cultist go to the donate tab you can donate one time or monthly and partner with us to create weekly content like this so uh, all that being said we'll talk to you folks next time on cultish where we enter into the kingdom of the cults talk to you guys soon